Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today in the Resilient Series, Killing the Cloud of Self-Doubt. Our presenter is Nicole Nash-Arnold. Nicole is a nursing career coach who helps great nurses transform into respected leaders. She shares her 15 years of experience in both senior and executive health leadership roles to germinate great leadership. Clinically, Nicole has over 10 years perioperative experience before moving into her nurse educator and management roles. Currently, she manages a privately owned emergency department in Brisbane. Nicole has postgraduate qualifications in perioperative nursing and currently a Masters in Nursing. Nicole is a member of the International Coaches Federation. Her career coaching blog can be found at www.nursemanagerhq.com. Nicole, welcome to the microphone. Thanks very much, Sue. Yeah, so today is our second of three uh, parts to our resilience series. Um, in another, um, we've recently talked about um, resilience in regards to control and uh, cognitive restructuring and rethinking the way in which we um, can think about things. And this time we're going to talk about the cloud of self-doubt and how we can identify that and turn it into an opportunity to build our resilience. We as nurses have often have um, a bit of a problem um, when we step outside of the core business of patient care and into any sort of non-clinical um, function that might step outside that core business. And to make matters worse, we give ourselves absolutely zero latitude when we do that. So scenarios where that might be a situation is where we're new to team leading um, or shift coordinating, uh, step into some sort of nurse education or patient education um, role that's different to pure clinical patient care, being a clinical nurse, taking on a quality portfolio. Sometimes when we're, as we've been a nurse for a while and we step and take us into, step up to take portfolios, um, you know, we wouldn't know an accreditation surveyor to fall over them, but the, the time has come when you start to, to pick up more and more responsibility. And of course, the other of, uh, time when this happens is when we're a new nurse manager. So they're the sort of situations where we're stepping outside that core business of patient care role, and it's a stressful transition. It's so often when the you step into that role and we don't often give ourselves a lot of opportunity to learn the lessons that we need to learn and we're not in our industry given a lot of opportunity to learn those soft skills. We, get, we have great opportunity to learn lots of other things but not necessarily these things. And what goes on in our own heads when we do that is often that you feel like you're a complete fraud. And the self-talk and the internal dialogue that goes in in that situation where we're outside of our comfort zone and no longer 100% a clinician is that you feel like perhaps you've somehow arrived in this role by accident, even false pretenses. You don't know the first thing about what you're doing and somehow you thought you could just turn up and say you're a clinical nurse now or that you're an educator now, you're a team leader or a shift coordinator or even a nurse manager. You felt like you could do that and now you're sitting in this seat and you think, what on earth was I thinking? When we're in that situation, what often people will do when those thoughts are populating their own head is that they think, right, just head down, bum up, no one will notice. But then the guilt starts to trickle in and you start to feel like people are going to know that you're the fraud that you feel like you know you are. You go, might go to a meeting and you're convinced that the entire room knows that you're a fraud. You get through a week, maybe a couple of months, nothing untoward happens, but then something does. There's something that does happen and you spend all of this time obsessing about how you've made this mistake and you weren't ready and you weren't sufficiently prepared and you're convinced you've got to call your manager and say, I'm a fraud, you need to get yourself a real nurse manager. It, in reality, all of that is completely false. To make matters worse, women are often even worse at it. Women will look at a position description and look at the key selection criteria and say, 
I can only do nine out of ten of those things, so that's a shame. I can't apply for that job. Whereas men will look at two out of the ten and go, how hard can the rest be? And they'll just step up and do it. A generalisation. But still women have a great propensity to for self-doubt more than other people. What's important is to remember that it's a bit like the first time you drove a car. You didn't know the, your clutch from your accelerator, but you stepped in, you had support, and you moved through the processes of learning. When you're a student nurse, you didn't know your kidney from your thyroid. When you're a no novice nurse, there's uh, some great stories about the old school RNs who tell the grads to go and get the fallopian tubes from CSSD. You went and you got them and CSD laughed hilariously at you. But you didn't necessarily obsess about it like we do when we're in a non-clinical role. But you've already had those experiences where you're consumed by self-doubt. Nurses can come to senior roles and management roles with often little or no experience or skills in dealing with those sorts of intangibles. But somehow you put the pressure on yourself to, for it to happen accidentally, like it's going to happen via osmosis. And so things like conflict resolution, dealing with difficult personalities, building a well-integrated team, building up culture, executing good communication plan, performance management, giving feedback, all of these things are things that you don't know about. That causes a great deal of stress when there is a disconnect between what you know and what you need to know. And that's where those with resilience have a natural and intuitive way that they navigate this with ease. And people without a natural resilience find it incredibly stressful and they often show all of the symptoms of what I call the cloud of self-doubt with all of that internal dialogue going on about how you're a fraud. That's what we're going to work through today because not everybody comes to this world with resilience but what's good is that it is proven in the research that it can be learned. There are three components to that resilience that we will go through and we'll break down each of those so that we can give a how-to guide about a few of the skills that we need so that we can start getting rid of that cloud of self-doubt. So the impact of low resilience for those of us who come to the world without a natural resilience and if we don't work on what we need to do to build on that resilience and learn those skills, there's an enormous body of research about this and I will generally speak in the context of the nurse manager but it does apply to any spectrum of those non-clinical roles that you find yourself in with shift leading, team leading, being a, um, taking on a clinical portfolio, clinical nurse, any of those things that you start to move out of purest clinician and start to take on some non-clinical roles. Without resilience then these are the sorts of things that are going to happen irrespective of whether you're a nurse manager or not. But the impact of low resilience, according to the research at the moment, is that nurses in um, have, in, in particular with nurse managers, it's incredibly important to build these skills because you have direct control over the patient outcomes and not just the four or so that you're allocated to when you're a purist clinician, but every single patient that comes through your health service now, month on month, year on year. And that patient experience, the productivity of the team, the regulatory compliance, all falls on the nurse manager and the job demands can be quite intense. And nurse managers with low resilience are observed in the research to work in isolation and that's an incredibly important point for when we get to the how-to guide later about how to build resilience because the working in isolation is a key symptom of low resilience. Nurse managers demonstrate hesitancy when they're low on resilience, they express powerlessness their directors and direct line reports are often frustrated by their tendency to work in silos with no collegiality and they have a propensity to express negativity really, really quickly. They have a lot of high stress, physical injury and burnout are often very common endpoints for those with low resilience who do not build in their resilience skills. And for, the, for their team, Turnover is often high, absenteeism is high, job satisfaction is low, retention is low for the nurse manager and for all of those that work in that team. Teams are poorly integrated and they're rarely high functioning. So it's an incredibly important skill to look at about 
what you need to build and how to build on that. Because in complete contrast, those nurse managers with high resilience are not burdened by that cloud of doubt and they showed completely different behaviours. They openly share their experiences and that is not just the good experiences, they share the good, the bad and the ugly. They work collaboratively in groups, they share ideas, they share skills, they consult each other, they bond with other nurse managers. Those with high resilience knew they were all in this leaky boat together. They offered and willingly received emotional and psychological support in the network that they have built and they are often confident and their behaviour demonstrated that they felt empowered. Directors of nursing or their direct line managers found nurse managers with high resilience to be collegial, less, aggress less aggressive and naturally positive and rarely a negative in their attitude. And they're always perceived by others as helpful. One of the key differences is that high resilience leaders will approach their director of nursing or direct report without the expectation that a problem is the Don's job to sort out. They come with a problem and solution. That solution may not be the one that is executed, but they don't just come and dump it on someone's door and go, well, that's your problem. They often come with some solution and are ready to engage in that process. They engage their staff also in the decision-making process and empowered them to take ownership of how the clinical department functioned. They were never in a situation where they felt like it was all about them and it reflects terribly on them if they didn't do all of the work. It's an incredible part of the role that they, of, of their function in the role is that they evolve and they constantly grow. And most surprisingly, and this is an amazing part, particularly for us, in other industries I don't think this factor will be so surprising, but in our industry where we are so risk averse, where we spit and hiss about every single possible risk that comes to the surface and we're incredibly par paranoid about any of that and we work incredibly hard to mitigate or eliminate risk in our environment. Nurse managers or nurse leaders who are strong and resilient are actually risk takers. They live in a world where they are able to look at a situation and have a go at a situation. Some things will work out and some things won't. And that concept, I think, is in contrast to who we are in our nursing and healthcare world where we're so averse to risk. But it is a really powerful skill that when you feel confident in who you are and you are not consumed by the cloud of self-doubt, you're very willing, willing to take risks. And it's something, that key point alone is something to let sit with you for a little while and think about what that means. Because in a world where we rid ourselves of that, then I think we suffer a great deal in terms of creativity. So building that resilience allows us to change the way in which we see many things and approach many things just in because we're more resilience, resilient than we could have been. So why is there resilience in some people and why is there not resilience in others? And what, what is the difference? There are some people that naturally have it. And it is very, very clear in the research that low resilience is linked with high stress and high resilience is linked to low stress. Resilience is a buffer for stress and it is, it, it is its antidote. And we don't all come with it, but it is important to understand that, as I said at the beginning, that, that sort of that resilience can be learned. And it's about breaking down the anatomy of what, a, what resilience is, working through the three C's of resilience and how that functions and where we can grow and where our deficits lie. So the three C's of resilience was something that was developed in 1977 with a researcher, Kobasa, who looked at male executives and how they coped with the world and what made the very successful guys work, function, strive and succeed and really what made them tick. And he found that those successful executives had three main characteristics that differentiated them and they were these, commitment, control and challenge. 
So if we go through exactly what those three things are, commitment. Someone high in resilience possesses a sense of commitment and what that means is that they actively involve themselves. They never alienate themselves or disengaged. They are never passive and they never exhibit avoidance behaviours. They have a genuine and palpable sense of purpose. They intuitively find meaning in events and things and the people around them. They are incredibly tenacious and they never, ever give up easily. And they always cope well under pressure. The second thing that they possess is control. And this is something that we looked at in, in another series in our first one where we looked at the breaking down of control and how we can build that. But when we lack control, it was that they, they, when, they when naturally resilient people possess control, they are able to naturally and authentically influence people. They never show helplessness, no matter how difficult their day or their situation that they're presented with. They act autonomously. They believe that they affect their own future and they never externalise. They are never a victim of their own circumstances. They influence with tools like imagination, knowledge, skill and choice. They are intuitively stress resistant as they have the, uh, take ownership of their own actions and the consequences of those actions. They develop broad and varied coping mechanisms and they're able to deploy those coping mechanisms irrespective of how the situation presents or how dire their predicament may be. The third element of resilience is challenge. They accept that change is the new norm, that they, as a result they anticipate change. When change does occur, they see it as an opportunity rather than see it as a threat to stability. Events that are like that to them are stimulating and they never find them threatening. These people transform themselves and grow rather than conserve and protect the status quo. They're the sort of three main elements to who you are as a naturally stress-resistant um, person. When we look at those three things in regards to someone who possesses the cloud of self-doubt, low, resili low resilience, high stress, and the driver for that is that cloud of self-doubt that tends to consume them, and we consider those three C's of resilience and what it looks like with the cloud of self-doubt. With commitment, they alienate themselves. They lack a sense of purpose. They don't invest in relationship. They do give up easily and they cope poorly with pressure. With control, they have a poor ability to influence people as they can barely influence themselves and take control of their own feelings. They possess none of the tools that are critical to influence, such as imagination and choice, and they're, because their brain space is consumed with their internal dialogue. They are stress resistant and they do externalise events and do find them very overwhelming. They have limited coping mechanisms. In terms of challenge, where change, and this is where the true nature of self-doubt lies, is the, that concept of challenge. They are extremely protective of the status quo. They find change very threatening and they certainly don't see the opportunity that may be offered. They are change dazed and I think that's a really, really important concept about the cloud of self-doubt in regards to challenges is the change dazed. And nurse managers cannot navigate the complexities of our healthcare environment when they're consumed with self-doubt. And as a result, they often have cognitive fatigue. And it's the complete opposite of those people that possess those strong coping mechanisms that they need to cope with the challenges that are presented on a daily basis. So what we're going to look at today in terms of that element of um, resilience and building resi resilience is therefore in that challenge to try and break down the change days and the cognitive fatigue and how we can build on that. And we're going to really break down and look more deeply at that challenge. There's a, um, a great Thomas Edison quote that I have not failed. 
I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. And then he invented the light bulb. And that's one of the key lessons for those with low resilience who are presented with a challenge is that never giving up and being tenacious and just rolling with the punches and learning is the most important element of building that ability to cope with the challenge and killing that cloud of self-doubt. If we consider a situation where a nurse manager might find herself who is intuitively finds herself in a new role it can, and with the self-doubt, truly believes she needs to confess to the hospital they need to find themselves a real manager, negative, she's defensive, she's isolated, she escalates all decisions to her manager, and then one day a directive comes from the executive team that the, the nurse manager's meeting, that all wards will now move from an exclusive primary nursing model to a team nursing model. For that nurse manager who's consumed by the self-doubt, she has no idea how that change is going to be perceived by her team. She doesn't understand whether they'll love it, hate it, be comfortable with it, no idea. But she can't bear the thought of holding a forum like a staff meeting to announce it. So she goes about telling a very trusted few, those few people that she knew from before she was a nurse manager and from her days as a clinical nurse. And the word slowly filters around. Chinese whispers, and before long there's outrage, there's confusion, there's miscommunication, there's complaints, there's sick leave, there's threatened resignations. And she's completely lost control of her situation and her stress is monumental. When we look at her three Cs, particularly in regards to her ability to cope with, there is complete denial that change is a norm. There is, she's blindsided by a change that was probably inevitable. She can see it only as a threat to stability and the events are entirely threatening to her. She has failed her attempt to conserve and protect the status quo and in turn, she has worsened her situation. As a consequence, this nurse's performance will be poor and for the remainder of the time that she tries to regain control of this change management process will undermine the working relationships that she has with her team. It's a terrible situation, an incredibly stressful situation. So we need to have a look at the ways in which the, the, we can develop some skills to take that situation on and learn the resilience that we need. And one of those ways is one of the techniques to be able to do that is considering our explanatory style. It's one of the most fundamental primal parts of self-doubt is the internal dialogue that goes on. And in this situation where we're talking about the change management that has completely blown up and that is currently de derailing for her, for her situation to regain the control of that situation, manage her stress and move forward in a positive way, how she languages it in her own head is essential. And the self-talk that she can motive runs around in her own head, can either be used for good or can be used for evil. And it's that time that is critical that she gets in control of it. So in terms of the explanatory style, the self-talk, the internal dialogue, there are three main elements to ensuring that the way you explain it to yourself in your own head has got some elements to be a positive impact rather than neg negative impact. There are three, the permanence, the pervasiveness and the personalisation. So the permanence, it's the option of viewing bad events as permanent or temporary. Naturally resilient people intuitively see bad events as temporary. In our scenario, our nurse manager can see this as simply teething problems as people adjust and manoeuvre and tweak to their new world or she can language it with the self-talk like it's never going to work, the team are never going to listen, exec are always doing this to me. She has a complete choice to go, this is bad for now, we're going to get through it. Pervasiveness. Naturally resilient people do not let bad events define them. They lack the initial confidence 
Uh, they may lack, lack the initial confidence like anybody, but their self-talk is never things like, I'm always hopeless at this, I have no idea what I'm doing, I'm a fraud. Those are the things that are pervasively really, really counter everything that you are doing. They might instead say, well, this isn't going very well. What are the next steps to get me through? They acknowledge it for what it is, moving on. Personalisation. Naturally resilient people don't blame themselves and they don't internalise bad events. They see them as circumstances, as the cause. They don't language it like, I'm the reason this team and nursing is derailing because I can't do my job. Instead, they might say, the greatest challenges to communication was that I couldn't reach all my shift workers. Next time, I need a better communication plan. Using those skills and using the way in which you allow that self-talk to happen inside your head is incredibly important to taking control of that situation. The next strategy that is important is the ability to overcome setbacks. When suffering the cloud of self-doubt, ruminating on setbacks is a common symptom of low resilience. To overcome that setback and as well as the rumination, it's critical to consider that you do have a choice. Choice one, accept the situation and make a plan. Choice two, resist the situation and fight the change. They're your only choices. The problem with option two is that you leave the situation and therefore you have no control and no input into the story that follows. You might as well, it might be easy, not that easy just to say, oh, well, move on. But there are some ways and some steps that you can work through overcoming a setback. Acknowledge the feelings. They are what they are and they're real to you. They may be perceived and the drivers may be perceived, but at the time you own them and you feel them. But what you do need to do is consider what's driving them. This is one of the great tools um, that can be used into what we talked about last week in terms of cognitive restructuring, where we can turn something that was a negative into a positive. You need to expand your view of success. Just because things haven't gone your way today doesn't necessarily mean it means failure. It may well be an opportunity for learning, just like when you apply for a job. How many times have you heard people in your circle, professional circle, saying, oh, I'm going to apply for that clinical nurse's job. I'm not going to get it. I just want to have the experience of going for the interview and writing the application and going through the whole process. They don't see that as a failure. They never saw it as a failure. They saw it as an opportunity for, for learning. And this is the exact same situation. It's also really important not to focus on the negatives, even though this is incredibly fertile ground. For our nurse manager whose change management process with team nursing has completely derailed, there is an incredibly fertile ground of negativity in why it was a bad idea and bad for the patients and the nurses are a mess and there's sick leave and there's so much negativity. But there's method in that madness whether you want to know it or not. No one's going to come along and like an evil psychopath and say we're going to give this really, really bad idea and make you implement the change just so we can sit back and watch the fun. There is a rationale and always there's a good reason for the rationale and there's always an opportunity for something really, really positive. But it's up to you as to whether you focus on the negatives or on the positive. And it's also a chance to put things into perspective. You have to put, pick your battles. This may not be an opportunity, even if it is a bad idea and a bad fit for your ward. You have to make a judgment as to whether this is the fight that you want to fight. You may want to react loudly and strongly, but it may cause significant damage to you and your reputation and the brand that you want to bring build as to who you are in an organisation moving forward with your career. And if you jump up and down focusing on the negatives and making everything a fart because you are stressed and you are managing the status quo, it may not be the fart that's worth farting. And there may be another fart around the corner that absolutely is. So building resilience to know that this is a stressful situation but we can get through it and there are opportunities and positives may be worth it so that you can keep that up your sleeve for something that is really worth fighting for. Ultimately, the goal of this 
situation with overcoming setbacks is really about self-efficacy. You need to be able to run through your emotional roller coaster, allow that to play itself out, give yourself permission to feel, to be angry, to be resistant, to focus on the negatives and then move through that. Give yourself some limits and go, right, what are we moving on? And then start to find the positives and the plan and the way out all on your own. This is a really critical part about overcoming setbacks and finding the way for you to be able to do it on your own for your own and find the positives on the other side. The next is a is a set of three tools, three functions that builds on your self-efficacy when moving from a place of self-doubt and resistance to owning a challenge. And again, it hinges on the concepts of perception and your perception. Thought awareness. So there's three elements, thought awareness, moving into rational thinking, and then moving into um, opportunity seeking. Thought awareness is an extension of what we were talking about earlier with regards to explanatory style and the three principles of self-talk and internal dialogue and the way, the choices that you have in terms of using those three skills for good or for evil. Awareness of what your thoughts are and those three people are going to be absolutely essential. Negative thoughts lead to fear of the future, which leads to putting yourself down, which leads to criticising yourself, doubting your abilities and you expect failure. And is a self-fulfilling prophecy generally because you're not using any of the brain space that you have available to you to be able to implement a great change, implement great communication and build great culture. All you're doing is spending all of your resources on ruminating on the negativity and the expecting failure. It damages your confidence. It absolutely damages your performance. Your performance in turn deteriorates and you paralyse your mental ability. That's where the cognitive fatigue kicks in. Those negative thoughts flit continuously in your consciousness unless we challenge them. And that's what's incredibly important about this thought awareness is moving to a place where you are aware of them, you acknowledge them, but now you need to start thinking about how you're going to challenge those and finding ways to identify the themes of those thoughts and those moving into the way in which you can find the triggers. So that's the next phase of, you know the thoughts, now we need to apply some rational thinking. Feeling inadequate as you do when you're doing this job for the first time is absolutely okay, but letting it consume every thought that you have is the point where you need to put some fences and boundaries around that behaviour and those thoughts. And that's where you have to be apply the rational thinking. Do you have the experience to do the job? People are aware that you were a novice when you took this on, just like they were when you were a grad, just like they were aware of that when you were a student nurse, just like they were when you started driving a car. They know who you are and what your strengths and what your weaknesses are. And so you have to rationally consider what people's actual expectations are of your performance and are the thoughts that you're having real or perceived. What are the cold, hard facts and the circumstances? It's more about the lack of confidence and perhaps it's more about the resources that you do or you don't have to affect this change. Is it that you need more support to navigate the change management for the first time? Did you bite off more than you can chew and therefore not a failure, but just one, an opportunity to wind back a couple of steps and rework it? Have you simply identified an opportunity where you could benefit from training or mentorship? Again, not a failure, an opportunity. Is this something that you didn't consider all the contingencies and something has cropped up that was unexpected? Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You've lived and you've learned. And if you didn't give your yourself the opportunity to step up again, then that learning is lost. Perhaps worrying about other people's reactions are the drivers to these thoughts. That's where it's important to start thinking about, you know, what there's a, a fabulous quote about what other people think of me is none of my business. 
it's about the circle of your influence and what you can achieve and not achieve and what you can't, what's outside the circle of your influence, there's no point expending any energy on. So applying some rational thinking to our situation is incredibly important. And finally, once you've done that, once you've applied some rational thinking, then we hope that there's a little bit of clarity that has come out of that and that you've learned a lesson a hard way. That's not the absolute truth, that you've just a lesson learned. There's a myriad of things that can't be taught, particularly in a situation where we're like this. There's no mentor can sit with you when you're saying, I'm going to introduce teen nursing that can say, this is what's going to happen. This is what people are going to say. This is where your pressure points are. These are the possibilities of your hotspots or your flashpoints for your team. No one can know. Human factors that are involved in change management are incredibly diverse and it depends on an, a million factors. And no one can tell you what those are going to be. You have to live the experience and then see where things pop out. This is actually an art, not a science. And so not a reflection of your abilities, just a reflection of how things panned out for you in the end. Another really useful concept to grasp is the concept of post-traumatic growth. We spend a lot of time talking about PTSD not to suggest that being a nurse manager or any kind of nurse leadership role is like being in some sort of traumatic situation. Um, but the world has an interesting way of providing balance to everything. There's always a yin and there's always a yang. And if that's something that you believe, then it's not hard to stretch yourself to the concept of post-traumatic growth. There's a well-established principle and body of research that suggests that when individuals are exposed to trauma, if we continue on that ex extreme end of the continuum, there's only a very few minority that develop psych psychiatric disorders. Often there's a situation where distress and growth coexist. That body, same body of research reveals that after a trauma or life-threatening illness or bereavement or any other traumatic event that mine, might, you might experience, Individuals report improved relationships, new possibilities for one's life, a greater appreciation of life, a new and improved perspective, a greater sense of personal strength and spiritual development. That trauma drives a contemplation about personal characteristics, purpose in life and what's important. So if we pull back from the extreme end of the trauma end of that continuum and put ourselves into a situation where we've, a bad event has happened, where our nurse manager has, change management has derailed and everything has gone wrong for her, then this is an opportunity for post-traumatic growth. In her own professional, in my own professional experience as a junior nurse manager, there have been many experiences where I've grown more as a leader as a result of my disasters than I have in my successes. Those mistakes were my nursery slopes. They were the green runs that I was skiing down that didn't go so well. But that's where I grew to know lots and lots of things that were incredibly important for who I am as a leader now, what my values are, what I believed in, what's important, what my vision was for, a future, for the future. Those learnings provide an incredible framework that I measure everything against. And it's the greatest outcome is the ability to be an authentic leader, true to your integrity, where there's no internal conflict with how you're moving forward. And that's the greatest part. If you really jump in with both feet into this situation that is a disaster, then there is post-traumatic growth at the other end for you to learn a great deal about who you are and what you're about to apply to your next situation. So now we've got some techniques about busting that cloud of self-doubt. Then it's important to go through some of the ideas about what we're going to do that with that. It's time to convert the overwhelm to something that's powerfully useful. And the important part about that is eat the elephant one bite at a time. And you do that with SMART goals. 
After all, the cloud of self-doubt comes from a place where you step back, take a look at the whole thing, and overwhelm happens. If you had a look at your entire role that you have just taken on, if you are a new nurse manager, for example, or you're a team leader, even if you're, you're shift coordinating for the first time and you start to think about, I need to get people off to tea, I've got 30 patients in this ward, I need to make sure that they're cared for, I'm the one that has to do it, I have to make sure people are off, what happens if someone gets sick, I've got to do the doctor's rounds, I've got to, and then all of a sudden you started to list in your head all of the things that you needed to do, you might need to do, the contingencies, the disasters that might strike, every single time overwhelm is going to happen. But eating the elephant one bite at a time means that you have a look at what's here and now and start to develop some goals. SMART is something that stands for the goal that you set for yourself that is specific. There's no point saying I'm a team leader and I'm going to make sure that this ward has 100% compliance with X, Y and Z um, competency. It is outside the, the circle of your influence. It has to be something that is specific to what you're doing. And you as a new team leader might be specific in terms of, I want to make sure that all of everyone gets off at the end of their shift on time have had a meal break and all the patients are settled and happy and everything is done. And that's specific. It's measurable. You know what's going to happen. You know that that is something that you can say, did everybody get off on time or was there overtime? It is something that is clearly you're able to say yes or no. It's attainable. If you're going to say every single shift now, whether I'm here or not, it's going to be Everyone knows it's going to be no overtime, not attainable. But for that specific shift that you're working today, yes. Is it relevant? Absolutely. You're certainly not saying that they're going to get a, uh, a fabulous meal because that's outside of what the scope of what you can control. And it's time-focused. This isn't forevermore. It's for now. The technique of using SMART goals means that you can rein in the scope with which you're hoping to achieve something and make it a little bit more consumable for yourself. Finally, the most important part about busting the cloud of self-doubt is find your tribe. There's a great thing going around on Facebook at the moment that's find your tribe and love them hard. And nothing is more important in terms of the cloud of self-doubt. And at the beginning of this webinar, I went through some of the key distinction that demonstrated the resilient from the non-resilient. And there was a theme there that you may or may not have discerned at the beginning. So if we re-look at that, the characteristics of those that possess resilience had things like this. They openly shared their experience, the good, the bad and the ugly. They worked collaboratively in groups. They shared ideas. They shared their skills. They consulted each other. They bonded with others. They, they were high and resilient. Those with high and resilience knew they were in this leaky boat together. They offered and willingly received emotional support and psychological support within their network. Central to each of those qualities is that the resilient people bond with others. They collaborate, they share, they support, they build networks, they mentor, educate, support, and they seek support. The non-resilient isolate and hide. Their fear of exposure drives them into exile. That worsens their thoughts because they have no one to provide perspective and share their own learnings to. There was a Gallup poll recently that found if you have a bestie at work, then you're seven times more likely to be engaged in your job. After all, we humans are pack animals. We crave friendship and interaction. So it is certainly a case of find your tribe and love them hard because this is a key to building resilience and dispersing that cloud of self-doubt. Those relationships in your tribe means that you will be more effective at influencing. You'll be more authentic in your leadership style. You'll be comfortable in your own skin. And new leaders often feel like they have to be a strong leader that looks like Gordon Ramsay, where they lay down the law and bark orders, not take no for an answer. Actually, it's the complete opposite in the principle of your tribe, love them hard. 
when people know the real you, the quirky or the funny or the intolerant or the girl with the high expectations or the guy with 17 cats or the girl who does roller derby on the weekends, then you're easily, more easily approached. It's easier to talk to, negotiate with, be honest with. Human interactions normalise and trust develops. Finding your tribe relies on four important principles. Trust, mutual respect, mindfulness, welcoming diversity and open communication. So five, not four. If you've locked yourself in an office because you're completely of the belief that you're a raging fraud and you're doing everything you can to keep a lid on that flawed belief, not only are those key perform not any of those key five principles allowed to have the oxygen that they need to prosper and those relationships wither and then one thing worsens and the isolation happens and there's no resilience and the stress increases. Whereas if you do the opposite and you start to have a look at what your self-talk and your dialogue is telling you and you can have someone that you can share with those things in, in with your tribe and you need to overcome setbacks to stop the ruminating and you have a tribe of people that are working for you that will support you through the good, the bad and ugly and a network of mentors that will help you as well. And when you're moving through thought awareness and rational thinking and opportunity seeking, then that tribe is going to be the tribe that are able to help you navigate that process and give you the perspective that you need to be able to do that. Post-traumatic growth is something that you do with other people. They're the ones that you be able to verbally process everything that you're going through. It's an incredibly important process to be able to have a sounding board to be able to do that. And certainly when you set those SMART goals, when you've gone through those processes of reigning in the self-doubt and then you need to extrapolate what you're going to do with them, having another sounding board to be able to say, is this achievable? Is it measurable? Is it attainable? Is it specific? And being able to have that feedback loop means that you will also be able to build those skills in a tribe of people who are supporting you. So hopefully at the end of that process, that cloud of self-doubt that has consumed you has stopped the thinking of I'm a fraud and I need to expose myself and be honest and you've actually internalised that and come out the other side and taking it for the learning opportunity that it is. So there's a great number of resources that I do have to that effect um, that are worksheets. There's a link to the cognitive restructuring. Um, there's a perceived stress scale, which is a validated tool that they use a lot of research to assess your own level of resilience, um, as well as some other resources on my website there at um, backslash resilience hash two, so that you can work through where you sit on the resilience scale from low in resilience or high in resilience, so that you can be better prepared for those situations as they crop up. Nicole, thank you very much for a very interesting webinar. Thank you. I love this resilience series. It's very clever. <laughs> it's um, one of those things that I don't think you think about until you're in the situation and then you don't know what to do with. No, and you think you're the only one who thinks like that. Absolutely. And that's about... As you say, resilient people are the ones who are able to identify how they are feeling and, and look for that support. Yeah. And overcoming setbacks. When you started talking about overcoming setbacks, my mind went back to, um, you know, situations where a problem happens and there's part of the group that will stop, think, re-strategize, discuss. Yes. Uh, there, there are other people who are paralysed by fear and do nothing. Yeah. And there's the other group that just start blaming everyone. Yeah. 
because it could not possibly have had anything to do with them and they expend so much energy trying to find the poor darling who they think it should be rather than being reflecting on themselves. Yeah. A perfect example of the resilient spectrum, I think, um, and how people respond to that situation. Yeah, look, it's very interesting. Human beings are the most wonderful creatures. Oh, complicated. I know, but as you said, it can be learnt, though. Yes, yeah. I think when you start to realise um, about resilience when you're one of the people that doesn't have it, uh, it's quite terrifying because the downsides of it and the impacts and the endpoints and just the stress alone that you carry, the anxiety and the stress alone, um, is such a burden. And it's rare that the intuitive natural skills that we're born into the world with are very, very difficult to overcome. But resilience is one of those things. It's well established um, that you can learn out of the low resilience and develop strategies to move into a place of high resilience. Which is a fabulous thing. Mm. Nicole Nash Arnold from Nurse Manager HQ, thank you very much for a very interesting webinar today. Lovely, thank you. To everyone who's listening, I would recommend you go to www.nursemanagerhq.com forward slash resilience hash two to have a look at um, the supporting documents and um, downloads that Nicole has made available for you. I wish you all an absolutely fabulous day and I look forward to seeing you online at another webinar very soon. Goodbye. <laughs>